public. There is a new authority which, is, which they're challenging, by the way. Um, I think it's a lot to do with us. I mean, as voters, we can, we can vote out the corrupt one. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But I think it requires a degree of leadership. And, and it will be uncomfortable in most of your countries to take on the vested interests. But, but somebody has to do it. And if it were not an important issue, you, you wouldn't be here. Um, it's always work in progress. Um, and I think it's important that we don't have, you know, that we don't believe that there ex exists such a thing as a, as, a, as a perfect and totally uncorrupt political system. This is, it can't be. Um, I expect any government to disappoint me. Even the new coalition, which I really support at home, I don't expect it to betray me. And I felt betrayed by the Labour Party after the sea scandals of the, of the mid 90s. So there's no new Jerusalem, there's no shining city on the hill. Uh, Obama is much more widely uh, admired outside the United States than, than in it. But to me, we've got a sane and principled man in the, in the White House. Uh, and we have a perfect government. But we have to, we have to keep that to it. It's not the perfect. The actual political consequences, in some cases, uh, they vary from party to party. Uh, some of the most spectacular miscreants were deselected by their parties and required to stand down. On the conservative side, these tended to be the old-fashioned MPs. These are tended to be MPs with, with um, well, sort of the Knights of the Shires. And their party, the modernizing party of David Cameron, wanted to get rid of them. So they have got rid of. Uh, on the Labour side, and I've got a chapter here, there's one of the awkward squad, but it's on a splendid character called Ian Gibson, who had been a, a thorn in his party's side, and they deselected him without, without, a, proper, without a proper hearing. Some were defeated. One of the, 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 one of the original uh, cases that came to mind <coughs> was the uh, then Home Secretary, a lady called Jackie Smith, who charged 88 pence for a light bulb. Then, Thousands are charged for some blue movies. You know, this is, this is unbelievable. Uh, and she was on a marginal seat and was always likely to lose it. And she held it in the previous election because she was a good constituency MP. It got her out of stand. But there were others, like the case I mentioned of the of the corrupt politician, where they where they stayed on. Uh, but I think the long term, the effect is is very beneficial because, as I was trying to explain, so many of these MPs were actually not widely admired in the House of Commons until they met their downfall over this issue. We have now got 230 new MPs. We have a huge part, uh, which is the highest new intake since 1945. And, and they don't want to serve one, two, three, four, five terms and only be remembered for their manual leaning. Uh, the application of the Freedom of Information Act has, has, is, a, is a huge consequence. There's a degree of cancer transparency uh, never before. Uh, so on the whole, I think that you know, we, we've turned a corner. But as I was explaining to the gentleman here, uh, we have to keep at it because you know, good things happen because people make them happen, and bad things happen because people let them happen. Just follow up on that uh, question. Is it that they are um, it, these corrupt MPs? Are they just removed from Parliament and then given some other sort of position, executive sort of position? Uh, they're mostly, uh, mostly, uh, most, of the, uh, most of them actually fairly elderly gentlemen. Um, I regret to say that one of them who paid back £30,000 of taxpayers' money has since been elevated to the House of Lords. Uh, it's by no means a, it's by no means a, a clean swing. And some of them they can, they can then charge um, half a year's salary, which is £32,000 as a, as a resettlement grant. This is a, if, if you lose your seat, then it's a kind of a golden parachute. Much the same as our Premier Football League, if the club gets relegated, it gets compensated a little bit. Uh, such is the 
feeling of anger against these uh, people that I think the, 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 the golden parachute payments are highly, highly controversial, but they're not, they're not suffering too much, except to reputation. If you become a figure of fun, and you are only remembered for your bell tone or your duck uh, it, it's, um, <coughs> it, it, it's it actually, that really does hurt. I remember some years ago, I was invited to give a, I think before I was even a member of the Department of the Party, I was getting invited to give a speech to an away there in one of the big five country companies, because this happens out in the commercial world as well. So I get in my usual spiel. Um, but the point I'm making here is that reputation is not a nice thing to have. It is absolutely essential. And in the commercial world, it is a bottom line issue. So the time I was invited to give this address, there were five, uh, there were the big five accounting firms. By the time I actually gave it, there were just the big four. One of them, Arthur Anderson, had collapsed on this your reputation because it was wound up with the Enron scandal. So I think the point, this is where politics and, and, and commercial world uh, connect, that reputation is more important than anything else. And if an MP's lost that, uh, I, I found it when I was an MP. I mean, you, it doesn't matter what the editorials say about you, it's the cartoons that are going to bring you down. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no. uh, my name is Hoon and I'm from Pakistan, but I've just finished my studies in London uh, I was living in London for the last few years. And my question is about the diversity in, at least in London, I have seen like it's overwhelmingly diverse city. So my question is, is there any relation in your view between the corruption and diversity, either positive or negative? Uh, this is a very delicate area. Uh, we, we have had a problem with our, our voting system since 2004 in an attempt to get a larger turnout. The rules on postal voting were relaxed. So people can now get postal votes which means on, on demand, which means you don't have to go to the, to the polling station. And, and they have been exceptionally high in constituencies with large ethnic minorities, where they have essentially been, where maybe the, the, the Mullah or the Imam or the secular community leader has a, has a, has a, has a, has a lot of influence. Um, but I don't think it's, a, it's not actually a, an ethnic issue. I got involved in trying to overthrow a, a, a minority and be called Shahid Malik in Dewsbury in Yorkshire, who was expected to have the, on the absurd side, he was a junior minister, and Terry Waite and I got involved in this. But we supported another minority businessman uh, of Pakistani origin, actually. Uh, and I got a furious letter from this guy on bringing about to stand for. Because in fact, we are entitled to support the world we like. Terry and I are just, are just individuals. Uh, there are some issues of, 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 you know, we're not sure about the extension of postal voting to be balanced. And for the first time, or well, actually the second time, we come to the Scottish parliamentary election, we are no longer sure of the integrity of our voting system. This is entirely new in the United Kingdom. You know, we used to, we used to think this was a third world or a fair state problem. Robert McGarvey in 2005 <coughs> offered to send a team of Zimbabwean election reserves to give them an the our election. Might not have been a bad idea. In the last hour of voting on whenever it was, the May or whenever, uh, a few thousand people were unable to cast their ballots because they couldn't get into the polling station. It was a higher turnout. The returning officers had not predicted it. It was, a, it was quite a national scandal. So once again, we are not presenting ourselves as, uh, as models for others to follow. We might be models for what you wish to avoid. Sure. Me. All right. I was going to ask you to comment on uh, the operations of the freedom of information legislation that led to the covering of all of this and its potential. Um, the reason for that is because uh, back home uh, in Kenya, where I come from, we've been uh, struggling uh, to achieve uh, freedom of information legislation. And uh, I suspect that uh, its spectacular effect in the UK is one reason why we are further away from achieving such legislation. Think, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is a good question. Uh, when our freedom of information was, legislation was adopted, 
about 2000 and, and, and one, and there was a five year lead time before it actually applied. Um, and so we didn't begin to buy it till about 2006. And the unsung heroine of the expensive scandal is an Anglo-American journalist called Heather Brook, who had studied the effects of the Freedom of Information Act actually in the state legislature in Washington State in the US. And she, she wrote a book on how, on how to apply it and, and how to make requests. And she made requests on the expenses of indiv individual prominent MPs in the House of Commons authorities, fought her to the name. Uh, and they very nearly reduced her to bankruptcy. Uh, but this is exactly the, the sort of uh, local heroine that I was talking about. But of course, countries like yours are going to look at the British example uh, and they're going to say, uh, we don't want this. In my experience, parties in opposition are always in favour of freedom of legislation and uh, information. When they get into power, they think it's not such a good thing after all. May I ask you uh, your personal opinion about my country, please? I think you know about that, uh, the, the situation about Thailand nowadays, the conflict between two groups of people, the red one and the yellow one. Uh, my question will focus on the, the, con the, the, the concept of the corruption that different from this group of people. It's kind of the conflict between uh, the group that support the, the, the notion that uh, Corruption is okay if government do something for the country. <laughs> and another group support honesty, even though the government do nothing, even the routine job. I suppose this comes around. So then, come, yeah. There are some work I do really can. <laughs> speed up the whole things. <laughs> there was a, you know, you were asking, would you rather be governed by knaves or fools? <laughs> We have actually the same, many of the same um, issues have arisen in the, Repub in the Republic of Ireland. And there was a notorious politician called uh, Charlie Hoy, Prime Minister. And he was, uh, you know, he was, his favours were for sale. And, and the Irish were all liked him because they felt, well, he's a bit of a rogue when he, when he gets things done. Um, and these are actually very difficult arguments to, uh, to, to deal with. Uh, I'm not an expert on Thailand, except I, obviously I've, I've, I've seen it on the television daily. Uh, I worked on it in Vietnam one time. Um, this is, this, this is, this, these are very difficult, very difficult arguments to come out because in the end, people want bread on the table and chicken in the pot. And they're going to, they're, they're going to thank the government that, uh, that, uh, that delivers that. But in, sort of, in Western democracies, um, I think when you've moved away from Various forms of dictatorship. Um, you are you are entering a, a new territory. We've got a very interesting uh, example in Northern Ireland at the moment. I mean, Northern Ireland was just quite as divided as Thailand. It wasn't between different colours. It was between different well tribes actually. But they they resolved their differences. And now the the chief minister of, of Northern Ireland, Peter Robinson, who was Ian Page's successor actually lost his House of Commons seat on a corruption issue involving some, the, the sale of some land. So people are now looking beyond their tribal allegiances, the red and the yellow, so to speak, uh, to deal with politicians regardless of their, of their, of their religion, but on the basis of their, of their behavior. And if you ever go to Northern Ireland now, it's absolutely amazing what's been achieved in the last 10 years. Quite astonishing. Um, often there are, I get driven to display in places like OPT, Palestine and so on, where I don't work anymore. Uh, but there are other countries where I'm, which I have been familiar with, Angola, El Salvador and, and, and Vietnam itself, where when you're there you think there is no hope for these people. But good things happen. And nearly usually the United Nations for all sports has played a role in this. So. Namibia is, uh, is, uh, is another one. Um, so I think you know, we are too easily driven to despair, except in the case of Israel Palestine. I don't see any way of that. But, you know, I look forward to a future in Thailand where it has to be much, much as in Northern Ireland, where different rules are applied. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
that's the you know, conceptually if uh is all about wealth attracting power and power attracting wealth. Isn't it time for us to draw a line of demarcation to separate wealth and power, wealthy people and powerful people and like isn't it time to have you know, certain qualification for being a EMP? There is no retirement age, there is no academic qualification to be EMP and it's kind of rules we do up. I'm suspicious of anyone as to, as to the as to the connection between wealth and, and, and power, because here we have to do issues of party funding. And our parties in the United Kingdom, and I just show some husks of what they used to be, uh, and they cannot attract a lot of funding, so they go to the millionaires. On the other hand, if you're going to start to set up uh, qualifications to be an MP or maybe limited terms. Um, I'm, I'm a libertarian, and I like the idea that anybody over the age of 18, who's not in jail, I think, can, can stand for membership of the, of the House of Commons, and then it's for the, for the people. And if the people think this person or that person is underqualified, they can, they can vote for somebody else. And then I'm again, we do get the, the, these ideas, then they're always, they're nearly always restricted. Uh, money is a much bigger problem. When you look in the States, I was at BBC Washington, I was one for 12 years. You could spend $18 million on the Senate seat and, and still fail to get elected. If you spend no money at all, it's, uh, as, I, as I did in the European Parliament. So what's the answer? The answer is to appeal to people's sense of right and wrong, which is where you guys come in, so that they will then give to a political party or to a candidate as they would to a charity, as they would to war and what, as they would to Guinness to save the children because they believe in the coins. When I stood for office in Parliament in 1997, I had the problem of funding a campaign. One of the good things about our system is that at a constituency level, we're not allowed to spend more than about 10,000 pounds, which you should be able to raise. So the first thing I did was I announced that we were, we were putting a 100 pound limit on each individual donation, so that we could, could spend as widely as possible the privilege of unseating your hand. And within two weeks, we raised 16,000 pounds, twice as much as I need. Two uh, millionaires from um, Liverpool gave me a cheque for 3,000 pounds each, made out to me personally. I could have gone off to the Caribbean there and then. I had to, I had to turn it, said, so I would get an idea. And, 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 and that, like this, this way, you, you enlist people's allegiances and you empower them. The Obama campaign was fascinating in this way. Two million contributions from an average of $85, about £50 each. This not only relieved Obama of the necessity to depend on big money and big oil and big interests, it freed him up to think for himself. The turning speech of his campaign was his Philadelphia speech on race relations. He had the time and ability to go away and think this through for himself. And it gave these two million people an ownership as a result. And I think enormously strengthened American democracy. That's the kind of thing I hope can happen in some of our countries. But you have to have candidates who appeal to people's idealism. The most critical thing to me is to actually to raise the caliber of the, of the average MP. There was an extraordinary creeps in our house of Congress. You wonder how they look at them. Total thugs. You know, and people of no distinction whatever. And a lot of very distinguished people don't really want to get into the murky world of politics because they're, they're worried that the press are going to have a go at them. So I think, certainly in my country, the, the imperative is to raise the caliber of the, of the, of the average MP to put it in so that you get people standing who people like me would be willing to pay money to come get elected. Right. Uh, I have a very ignorant question, but you said something perhaps I didn't understand. What is wrong with the 88 pence light bulb? There was nothing wrong with the 82 pence light bulb, uh, it was, except that it was claimed on her, what she claimed was her second home. The second home, this is Jackie Smith, was where she lived with her family and her husband and her two boys. It was the family residence. It was where they were registered to vote. She claimed that her main home was a single room in her sister's house, house in South London. In other words, this was so obviously a scam that she could have claimed for the light bulb for what was really the secondary home. Uh, and this is what they were doing on a large scale. They were 
they have freedom to designate whichever residents they wish as their as their main home. That was what was wrong with the attitude. That's that part. Okay. Well, I know that you have you spent a lot of time in Bosnia and uh, uh, especially during the war, uh, and you mentioned that the connection between the war and corruption, the, the occurrence of corruption. But I was wondering if maybe that can be seen even from a different angle that corruption can be also one of the causes of the war and the maintenance of the war can be only uh, one of the reasons for that, uh, for, the, for the money actually and for the warlords to gain more money. And another thing, um, what I wanted to ask is that I know that you um, also uh, recently have been to Bosnia and I actually think that you interview, interviewed my mother. <laughs> but, um, um, what do you see this, how do you see the situation now, the present situation in Bosnia compared to what you've seen before uh, when it comes to the, the, the powers and the, the, the political parties seen in Bosnia and the, especially the presence of corruption even though we have now a different kind of setup and uh, uh, some of the new parties that weren't there during the war and after the war are now here but they prove to be as bad as those uh, that may be seen before them and even more corrupt than, than the nationalistic parties that were uh, uh, presented as, as the worst ones, actually. So mother got a chance to form a finance minister. Yeah. Right. Lovely lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was doing what I was doing. I was doing, I have what's now called a face for radio as far as the BBC is concerned. So I don't think much television. But it, it's just over 30 years since the death of, of, of Tito. And uh, while some of the witnesses were still alive, it was interesting to, to having seen the effects of the war, I was analyzing the causes. Was Tito in any way responsible? And actually, you know, in a sense he was, because he hung on to power far too long and his abilities were declining because he just loved, loved being sort of monarch for life. I would tend to regard corruption uh, as an effect rather than cause. As you know, the causes of that war were extremely complex. Yeah, internal, they were, they were manipulated with most. Yeah, and they and they and they still are. And one of the sort of uh, mistake that the international community always makes when it's on, on post-war reconstruction and, and they made it with various uh, high representatives at least. And, and Paddy Ashdown admits this. Was that you start you think that the waving the magic wand of democracy is going to solve all the problems? Well, well, well it doesn't. Uh, the sad truth that well, you know, better than I do, but wasn't today, there's not much of that comedy. So <coughs> there's black market, there's, there's crime, there's trafficking, and so on. I was appalled uh, at the extent of the, uh, the, 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 the extent to which the, the warlords have profiteered. If you ever go to a place like Vitex, it's like it's like it's like Las Vegas in the Balkans now. And you know, I, mean, I think all these all the idealism of the NGOs and uh, tens of millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested and the lives that have been lost, the, the, the British and the French each lost 70. Never mind, I mean, the, the Soviet cemetery of the supplement really takes you back, that sort of hero cemetery. You know, the idea that there's only one group there that, that lost, and the Serbs lost extraordinary numbers. And, and for what? Well, I think it's, I, I don't think I'm going back to I don't think it back to where you were. Uh, <coughs> one of the things that happens is civil wars obviously the worst of wars. They're, they're, they're slow to start because people know well and they're very, they're very hard to bring to an end. And why did, one of the reasons I think that war broke out in Bosnia in 92 was a lot of people had lost the collective memory of the horrors of the Second World War and the of the concentration camps. And like Tony Blair, they thought the going to war was rather than to, to settle their, their differences. But I also believe that the culpability of that Ripley's book about it lies not only with, with, in Sarajevo and in, and in Zagreb and in, and in, uh, and, and, and in uh, Belgrade, but in the capitals of Europe, especially London and Bonn. I'm an hour to spend on dealing with my theory of how we, how we trade in so many lives for a recognition of creation. Seven ninety one, a true, a true, a true scandal. Um, but there's a kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm 
I'm not despairing. It's the country I love, second only, sometimes even more than that. Beautiful, wonderful place. Wonderful people. And I've got a, one of my most difficult times in September, I've got to appear at the Carriage Twilight. That's a real theatrical event. Uh, and I was actually fairly close to Kevin for a while. He was very helpful. But it's, uh, you can actually, um, Fairmont's interesting. It's a, in a bit of real courtroom drama. You, you Google ICTY, an international criminal flight in Yugoslavia, and you're in court out. So you can see this whole thing uh, un unfolding in, in streaming video. And I do believe that, I'm off of your question here, but I do believe um, the processes of international justice are vital to bring war criminals to trial and so on, but I don't think they have been evenly applied in, the, in your country. Uh, nearly all the convictions have been of Bosnian Serbs, and some, some serious criminals, in my view, uh, have escaped. Uh, I did actually give evidence on behalf of TMA Blaskic, a creation general, who was charged with complicity in the Archmichi. Massacre in April 1993. In fact, I'm good my evidence did because it got put away for 41 years. Then in the in, in Tudjman's palace, they find evidence that in fact this atrocity was committed, as I knew it was, outside his chain of command. Uh, but it is a prosecutor's court, as Nuremberg is a prosecutor's court, and I sometimes feel it is in the business of providing um, um, convictions rather than justice. We talk about this later. What do you think of the Milosevic case? The Milosevic case was quite similar in, in, in some ways to the, the Karadit case. Um, it was the, the, and I hope some lessons have been learned from it, because the charge sheet was far too long. They, at that point, had the theory that everybody who claimed to have been victimized by Milosevic's decisions had a right to some part of the charge. Well, in the end, the thing went on so long. Um, you can. These, these cases, they last they lost for years. And then the kind of thing that happens, the judges are fairly elderly. There's usually a panel of three judges, and one of them will fall sick and die. And then, they, and you can, you can, then the defendant has the right to start the work again. Uh, I think, well, I think the, the, verdict, we, the verdict is out because we don't know what the verdict would have been. But one thing these two cases have in common, Karadich and Glossovich, you cannot be convicted by newspaper headlines. And I am concerned that, unlike Nuremberg, there has not really been a high-profile acquittal. And I wonder why not. And if the evidence isn't there to convict, convict Karadich, you should not be convicted, whatever the outcome. Actually, there was maybe the Tokyo trial, because uh, Nuremberg, uh, the judges were from the four allied countries, and uh, in Nuremberg they were wider, yes. so wider among the countries. But, but that's one of the... Uh, no, in, in, in Tokyo and especially in, in, in Singapore, it's just sort of string them up. You know, if it was summary justice would put it in mind. But I don't think that, that was not due process. Or not. My name is uh, Uzoi, um, I'm from Nigeria. Um, most of the questions, majority of them, center on corruption. And you did say that as civil society groups, that it is better for us to take on integrity than on corruption. Now, you begin to look at a country or a situation where corruption is very, very endemic. Because for me, I think there's corruption that is normal or reasonable, and there is corruption that is really, really endemic, deep to the root. And that is the case we have in Nigeria. You did answer when this man asked his question that we need politicians who can appeal to the sense of morality of people. Now, in a situation like Nigeria, we have this situation where the civil society groups begin, because what happens is that during elections, during campaigns, they begin to give money, bags of rice, and so on and so forth, to the people to vote for them. The civil society groups devise a strategy, educating the people that when they give